Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me. And thank you for your interest in the University of Toronto, Mississauga. I'm so excited to see you all here. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. I see that we have people as you know close as Mississauga and Hamilton and the greater Toronto area. We have people from all over Ontario, people from all over Canada, and of course, people from all over the world, Mongolia, Nigeria. Welcome. I'm so glad that you're here. My name is Jen Duggan and I'm a student recruitment officer here at the University of Toronto, Mississauga. I'm joined by my colleague, Michael, and by Maddie, who's a current UTM student. And I'd like to just take a moment to really let them introduce themselves. Michael and Maddie. Maddie, go ahead. Okay, so uh, hello everyone. As Jen said, my name is Maddie and I'm a current UTM student. I'm a second year. Um, I'll talk about myself a little bit later on, but I work with uh, these, you know, two great, amazing people at our uh, Student Recruitment and Admissions Office, and I am so excited to be joining you tonight. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Michael. I am the Communications Manager here uh, at UTM. Uh, I am going to be managing the chat today. So uh, if you, uh, not just me, you know what, I should say a shout out to my colleagues Neha uh, and Amy. Uh, they're also going to be managing the chat with me. So if you have any questions throughout the stream, put them in the comments. We're going to answer them um, as they come in. Um, we're also going to be taking questions up at the end of the stream. So anything that we maybe don't get to or we'd like to just post to the broader audience, um, we're going to do that at the end. So um, one thing I will say is uh, avoid uh, putting in your student number, any sort of personal information, your emails into the chat. We want to make sure that um, you keep your privacy, you keep the things that are yours. Uh, so uh, yeah, happy to, happy to get started. Thanks, Michael, and thanks, Maddie. Um, in a moment, I'm going to pass the floor over to Maddie. She's going to be able to give you a virtual tour of our beautiful campus. She's going to teach you a little bit more about the school, um, talk about her experiences here at UTM. And if you do, just as Michael said, if you have any questions over the course of the presentation, please do not hesitate to share them in the chat. Um, as Michael mentioned, we have Neha and we have Amy here that are going to be in the chat. I'm going to be jumping in when I can as well to answer your questions along with Michael. Um, so we've got lots on the go. Um, and you know, at the end of the presentation, Michael and I, as Michael said, are going to rejoin Maddie and we're going to answer all of your questions live before we wrap up the event. So. To begin our presentation, let's just take a moment to acknowledge the land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. And today, this meeting place is still home to many Indigenous people from all across Turtle Island. And we truly are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Now, as most of you might know, the University of Toronto is one university with three different campuses, meaning that you have three separate learning environments to choose from. All three of our campuses have something unique to offer, but the important thing to remember is that all three of our locations are going to offer you the same world-class education and you'll be graduating with the same University of Toronto degree. Our Mississauga campus is located here in Mississauga, just 30 minutes to the west of downtown Toronto. Our UTM community is home to just over 15,000 undergraduate students who study in the arts, sciences, and business. And as an applicant to UTM, you will choose, or perhaps you've already chosen, between 12 different admission categories, which actually can lead you into over 180 different programs, which span over 18 different academic departments. So what this means for you is that you have a wealth of options to choose between. The UTM, so the University of Toronto Mississauga, we call it UTM, does have a lot to offer students and subsequently students choose us for a wide variety of different reasons. So as you can see on this slide, there are quite a few things that you may want to consider as you begin to think about where you want to continue your academic journey. First and foremost, here at UTM, you're going to be getting the same outstanding University of Toronto education that is recognized all around the world for its excellence. And it's taught by world-renowned professors and faculty who come to us from all across the globe just to teach at our institution. As a U University of Toronto Mississauga student, you're going to have the opportunity to study at an innovative, contemporary, and green campus surrounded by woodlands situated on the banks of the Credit River. 
And one of my favorite things about our UTM campus is our desire to protect the beautiful green space that surrounds our campus, which is home to lots of wildlife, including two distinct herds of deer and our buckfast bees, which live in a couple of apiaries on top of some of our buildings. So as we grow, we're less likely to tear down the forest that surrounds us, and we're more likely to tear up an old building and replace it with something that's greener and more sustainable. Um, this is probably going to provide a home for more student-centric space or more research and learning opportunities, or even more more administrative space that helps to keep everything moving smoothly. UTM is also home to a variety of unique and dynamic programs, including Canada's premier forensic science program. We also have our theater and drama studies program, which is jointly offered between the University of Toronto and Sheridan College. And of course, we have our communications, culture, information and technology program, which is also unique to our campus. When you come to UTM, you don't just become a student here but you actually become a part of our community. And with that comes a wealth of opportunities to really help you get involved, to build relationships and really make a tangible difference within our community, as well as an abundance of supports that we have in place designed to meet you where you are. The goal is to support your transition from high school into university and ensure your academic and professional success as a student and beyond. And finally, thanks in part to all of those other things, we do tend to attract students from all across the globe. With students from more than 110 different uh, countries, we really do have a global community and we're really, really proud to have the opportunity to nurture cultural diversity and build global fluency. Now, as you probably can tell, I can go on and on about the wonderful things that makes our campus and our community great, but luckily, we have the incredible fortune of being joined by Maddie. And so with that, I'm going to call Maddie back on screen to give us a virtual tour of the UTM campus and to talk to you a bit more about our school and about her experience here as a student at UTM. Maddie? Hello, uh, thank you so much for that, Jen. Very informative. Um, so as she said, I am here to do a campus tour for you. Uh, lots of cool stuff to, to learn about our campus. So as I said before, I'm a second year student here at UTM. Uh, I am doing a double major in anthropology for science and history of religions. So if you have any interest in you know, those programs or that kind of content, feel free to put in questions. I love nothing more than to talk about my work um, and my programs. I don't get to do it a lot, so I definitely enjoy it. Um, it's a really great intersection about the past and the way that people worship. And it's just one of my favorite things to learn about. Um, so, which is really cool because you can do a lot at this campus here. So, now that I've properly introduced myself, we will begin with our tour and we'll move on to our first building, the Kneff Center and Innovation Complex. All right, so the KN building or the Kneff Center and Innovation Complex um, is a really nice calm building. And as I said, it's our first. So this building is home to the departments of management, economics and commerce, as well as some additional graduate programs. Um, one of my favorite parts about this building, as you'll see in the top right photo is the KN Rotunda. Um, it's a really nice, you know, chill study space, but they also hold a lot of guest lectures and other events. Um, I'll talk about a little bit more of that later too, because some other buildings have this feature, um, but I definitely recommend it if you're interested in coming here to check out those kinds of events. They're a really great way to get to know other students, faculty, and just sort of learn a bunch of new stuff. So this building has some really cool features in it, um, in particular, the recruitment and admissions office, the office of the registrar, the finance learning center, as well as the Blackwood Gallery. The Office of the Registrar functions pretty similar to a high school guidance counselor. Um, so hopefully, you know, some of you sort of get the basics of that. Um, but if you're not really familiar with that concept, the Office of the Registrar deals with financial and academic issues with students. So they provide advice with course enrollment, um, fees and tuition payment. They also offer academic and financial advisors to students. So they're a really great resource. Um, they are for students that are currently enrolled, but you know, rest assured you're not completely alone. That's where our office comes in. So the recruitment and admissions office, like I said, is for prospective students, families, and employers, or not employers, educators, I guess I should say. Um, this lovely girl in the photo is Amy. She works in our office and is a, a friend of mine. Um, 
So you'll meet a lot of students uh, at the SRA because, you know, we do have a lot of experience with students. We often do these kinds of, you know, not just virtual tours, but in person. So if you do get a chance to come by, you know, feel free to say hello to one of us. Um, we deal with a lot of cool stuff. So academic requirements, application processes, admission questions, um, and things like campus introductions. So events like these, uh, also on-campus opportunities like Fall Campus Day, um, the Ontario University's Fair. We also have March Open House coming up this Sunday. So if you, you know, are in town and get the chance to attend, I definitely recommend it. In KN, there's a bunch of larger lecture halls, and one example of that is KN 137. This isn't, there isn't anything particularly special about this um, room, but it's a really great example of some of the kinds of classrooms you'll be exposed to as a first year student. First year courses tend to be larger and thus held in larger classrooms um, just because they're more generalized. So I'll give you a personal experience. In first year, in my biology course, you had bio students, life science students, uh, forensic students, anthropology students, you'll get a really wide mix of people and programs. Um, but that sort of changes as you go up into higher years, particularly third and fourth when courses get more specialized. And I know this can be a little bit intimidating for students right off the bat, but you know, you're not completely alone. Uh, we have what are called tutorials and practicals to sort of negate the large numbers. So there are one hour sessions held once a week. They're attached to um, a larger class, which can be you know, one long lecture or multiple lectures, whatever. They're run by a TA and they're usually pretty small. So between 20 to like 25 students. Um, although I do say not everyone shows up every week. So it's, pretty, it's gonna be pretty smaller, you know, smaller than that. Um, but yeah, so it's just one of the resources as well as office hours that students have to be able to connect with their TAs and professors. So on the bottom floor of the KN building is the Finance Learning Center. This is designed to help students mostly in like commerce, like economics, finance courses, um, build business related skills. So that can include research skills, gaining certificates, as well as software experience. Uh, finally, in this building, we have Blackwood Gallery, which is a super cool part of campus in general and kind of encapsulates this very art centric uh, campus that we have. It's very cool. So the gallery in particular curates a lot of exhibits. They have national, international and even local artists. Uh, so if you're ever on campus, definitely recommend to check it out. So we'll move out of KN now and move on to the William G. Davis building. So as you may have seen in that little clip, the William G. Davis building is one of the oldest spaces on campus, uh, built in 1974. Most students refer to it as Davis. As you'll see in this tour, a lot of us tend to shorten things. Um, I think it's just we don't have the time to say the full names, but we'll try. I'll try to explain them as best as possible. Uh, so in William G. Davis or Davis, there's a lot going on. So I'll just preface it by saying that. So in that little clip, you would have seen, you know, we have science spaces, um, but there's also a lot else going on. There's multiple academic and student based uh, units and offices in here as well. And then in terms of science programs, we have anthropology, earth sciences, bio, chemistry and physics. Uh, we also have the recreation athletics and wellness center in here, as well as the bookstore. Um, so like I said, just be prepared. There is quite a bit of information, but we will get to the next building eventually. <laughs> so on one of the lower floors of Davis is the Health and Counseling Center. They're a really great resource for students that offers physical and mental health supports to students. Uh, this includes doctor's appointments, personal and group counseling, as well as nutritional counseling. They're pretty involved on campus in terms of their like promotion and education. So you'll definitely see them around. Near the Health and Counseling Center is the UTM Bookstore, which is essentially a one-stop shop for everything with a U of T logo on it. Um, so obviously they have a bunch of clothes, but they also have a bunch of school supplies, um, including stationery and electronics. So if you're ever, you know, need something in a pinch, this is a really great place for students. So if you're ever on campus, you'll definitely run into the rock, even if you're not going there for use. Um, some of the parking lots are near this place. So a lot of people run into it, even if unintentionally. 
So the Recreation Athletics and Wellness Center is a full athletic facility available to all students. It has an indoor track, an eight lane swimming pool, gyms and weight and exercise equipment. Uh, they also have a bunch of different resources as well, including personal trainers, drop-in sessions, and women-only gym hours. Now moving up to the upper floors of Davis, we have the Davis Food Court. So this is one of the larger food options on campus, um, aside from like residence halls. So it's really popular with students. Um, beside that is like the Davis Meeting Place. So if you're ever here, it tends to get a little bit noisy, but it's definitely a good place to like catch up with friends. Uh, they also have a bunch of different options for students, including halal, gluten-free, and vegan. So as I mentioned, there's a bunch of different offices and units on campus designed for students. One of these is the Career Center. So this is on one of the upper floors, and they offer a bunch of cool stuff. So there's one-on-one -on -one career counseling, um, employment strategy workshops, resume and cover letting building workshops, as well as mock interviews. They also do a lot of on-campus engagement in terms of inviting employers and professionals on campus to talk with students. Uh, they're a really great, essentially a resource for guiding your academic career, graduate and post-grad life. Uh, the cool thing is they're also available to students up to two years after graduation, which is also super helpful. So similarly to the Career Center, we have the Center for Student Engagement, um, another one of those offices on campus. These guys deal a little bit more with like volunteer work, um, essentially outside of the classroom. So they run a bunch of different services, um, including like first year supports like Launch or um, Eagle Connect, which is designed to help first year students not only transition into university life, but prepare themselves for that because sometimes it can be you know, it can be pretty stressful. I completely understand. Um, also under the CSE is the CCR or the co-curricular record, which will be super useful. So that's why I like to point it out. It records all out of classroom activities and is really useful for on-campus jobs as well as um, research opportunities. So, you know, while it may not seem that, you know, interesting, it's definitely a great, great resource. And a lot of times getting CCR is pretty easy. Um, I know in myself, I'm involved with our STEAM days. So it stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, Arts, and Mathematics, if you're not familiar with it. Um, what the STEAM days do is teach elementary school students and high school students the basics or introductory um, courses to those kinds of topics. So there's lots of different opportunities for everyone. So we also have the International Education Center or the IEC. As Jen mentioned earlier, the concept of global fluency. What did I do? Oh, I apologize. My thing just shut down. Sorry, just give me one second. I apparently seem to have an issue. All right. So let me put this back up. I, I apologize. There we go. That should be, okay, there we go. So we're just gonna speed through this really quickly so I can get to back where I was. So as I was saying, so we were on the International Education Center. So as Jen said, there's a really big emphasis on global fluency and the IEC is just another example of this. Um, essentially what it does, it also helps with like international students, but they help domestic students as well through things like um, the abroad program. And I'll take a second as we're going through this to sort of talk about that because I have a personal experience with it. I haven't been there yet, um, but I am going to go on an abroad program this summer to Italy for a course. So if you're interested in sort of traveling and you know combining that with your academics, I definitely recommend the IEC. They are a great resource. So now we move on to my favorite parts of Davis, the science lab. So it may sound a little nerdy to talk about it like that, but as an anthropology student, I spend quite a bit of time here. So this photo, which was taken by Randy, another individual in our office, is sort of an example of the kinds of stuff you'll run into in these labs. So on the main floor of Davis is the anthropology and biology labs and upstairs is physics and chemistry. 
these are where a lot of practicals happen. So as I mentioned before, those one hour sessions once a week with a TA. Um, so this is just kind of an example of like the artifacts or the kinds of objects that you'll come into contact with. A lot of stuff in the labs is very hands-on. So if that's something you're interested in, uh, definitely you should be excited for it. So lastly, in Davis, we have accessibility services. These guys are designed to support students in all aspects of university life. So they provide a bunch of stuff like peer note taking, um, assignment and exam accommodations like extensions, as well as learning strategy, strategy workshops. So if you're a student that needs these resources, they are very open and accessible to you. If you don't, they offer a bunch of other good opportunities, uh, particularly through that peer note taking service where you can gain CCR. So from here, we just go nearby to the communication, culture, and technology building. So the, communicate, the Culture, Communication, and Technology Building, aka CCT, is home as one of, uh, Jen mentioned earlier, one of three UTM-specific programs. So Forensic Science, Theater and Drama Studies, and Culture, Communication, Information, and Technology. Uh, within that program, and I like to talk about it just because it's something that's super popular among students, but a lot of newcomers don't really know what it is. So they include a bunch of interesting specialties like digital enterprise management, professional writing communications, and technology coding in society. It's a very modern tech-based program. It's very reflective of the CCT building itself, which um, features a bunch of lecture halls and classrooms, as well as computer labs on the upper floors. Also in this building is the IT service desk, which is super useful. So, one example of the lecture halls you may come across in this building is CC 1080. So similar to KN 137 from before, first year lecture halls tend to be pretty big. This one is one of the larger ones on campus. It fits up to 500 students. So you may come across this one, you may not, but it's always good to be prepared. So like I said, um, actually beside that classroom is the IT service desk. So this is where students can go for um, tech assistance. They also pick up their T cards here and you can also get assistance with personal devices. So another interesting feature of this building is the MIST Theater or the Multimedia Studio Theater. Everything inside this place is modular, on wheels, or portable. It allows students to use the space according to their performance needs and is one of multiple self-expression-based opportunities for students on campus. So if you're ever there, you know, not a lot of people talk about it, but I, I suggest you check it out. So connected to CCT, similar to many other buildings, there is that connection, um, is our next building, the Hazel McKillian Academic Learning Center. So named after the former mayor of Mississauga, Hazel McKillian, the HMALC uh, is one is a really nice place on campus. It's pretty simple. So it's really cool and easy to talk about. It has one of two campus Starbucks and is home to our library. So the library has a bunch of stuff going on. So bear with me while we go through this. We are part of what's called the U of T tri-campus library system. So as you may have seen on that little quick fact, Altogether, U of T is the third largest library system in North America, but rest assured, you have access to all of those resources. So through this tri-campus library system, we have the interlibrary loan system. So you can get resources from either other campus um, delivered, you know, it's no additional cost to you. And it's definitely really great for students, especially if you just want to learn new things um, or if you need a resource that isn't available on our campus. So in this photo is the research and reference desk. It is definitely one of the best parts of the library. At this desk, they have librarians, uh, liaisons, and um, research specialists that are designed to help students in a bunch of different ways, including program-specific and course-specific advice. They can help you with your general research when it comes to specific assignments also, which is super cool. Um, also, if you're ever in a situation where you need help with referencing, they're a great spot to go. I do like to point that out just because some students may not 
you know, have experience with a bunch of different citation methods. And if you're ever confused, definitely check these guys out. They're really great for that. Also in the library is the information and loans desk. They're right beside the research and reference desk when you're in the library and they deal out or they loan things like calculators, course materials, laptops, and chargers. So besides the, I, apologies. So uh, once we go past the uh, HMLAC is the instructional center. Mostly referred to as IB, the Instructional Center is a really interesting place on campus because it actually features no departments or programs attached to it. So it's exclusively used for lecture halls and classrooms, and you'll definitely find yourself here at one point or another. So it is filled with a bunch of cool stuff, including large scale lecture halls like IB 110 and 120, as well as study spaces that can be booked out. And there's computer labs upstairs. Um, there's also a mini food court, which has Subway, Quesada, and Avento Sushi. So just outside IB is the UTM shuttle bus. This is a bus that takes you directly to the St. George campus and back. It's free to UTM students to use. It's pretty reliable, which is super nice as well. Um, it usually takes between 30 to 45 minutes, but, you know, obviously it depends on traffic and things like that. But it's definitely great if you either want to take courses at St. George or you just want to go downtown. So moving out of IB, we'll go on to the next building, Manjue and Nandamoanen. So um, actually, the newest building on campus, as you may have seen in that quick fact, uh, it was built in 2018. This building, Manjue Ananda Moanin, which means the Gathering of Minds and is an Indigenous name, is designed to acknowledge the Indigenous history of the campus as well as the future uh, goals of the campus. Um, the cool thing about this building and what it represents for the campus's intentions is a focus on you know, indigenous communities and the indigenous identity. So in this building is actually the indigenous center and we have an all nations powwow coming up on Saturday. So it's just an example of the kind of connection this building represents between UTM and the local indigenous communities. This building is equipped with a bunch of different stuff, including lecture halls, tutorial classrooms, as well as multiple social sciences and humanities programs including English and drama, philosophy, historical studies, language studies, political science, and sociology. Um, as I mentioned earlier in the KN Rotunda, the MN Atrium is also another great space for events. So the photo at the top right, um, you can see a little bit of the atrium. I had a really great experience last year. I got to help out with an event held by uh, the UTM Institute for the Study of University Pedagogy, which may sound confusing, but they essentially deal with everything and introductory to university life. So it's definitely a great place, like I said, to meet other students, faculty, and just sort of learn a bunch of new stuff. So um, similar to the ISUP, as I mentioned, is the Robert Gillespie Academic Skills Center. So on the third floor of MN, this center supports students in a variety of ways, including uh, just general university skills such as writing, reading, math, and time management. They also offer one-on-one -on -one appointments, workshops, and various other programming. They're a really great resource when you're in the midst or finishing an assignment because they give critical feedback before and after submission. So if you're ever a little concerned on your writing, if you ever need a little bit of extra advice, definitely head over to these guys. So as I mentioned before, the Indigenous Center, um, this is designed to support students, staff, and faculty while promoting equity and inclusion across campus. They run various on and off campus programs and events for Indigenous and non-Indigenous students. So as you go through the MN building, if you were usually on a person, you know, in-person tour with me, I would definitely point this out to students. Similar to the lecture halls we've talked about before and the science labs, MN 1190 is a good example of tutorial classrooms. So like I said, those one hour sessions once a week attached to a class. 
these mostly are done in connection to social sciences and humanities and tend to be more discussion based, but this is sort of like a general layout or classroom you may come into contact with. So continuing past 1190, we move on to the next building, Deerfield Hall. So moving on to what I call MN's little sibling is Deerfield Hall. It is home to our theater and drama studies department, psychology, as well as computer science, mathematics, and statistics programs. Um, it's named after the deer on campus, which I'll show you a photo of in a second. It's definitely one of my favorite parts of campus. And this, like MN, is one of the quieter places to study. Um, it is on the building is the second campus Starbucks, the one I mentioned earlier in the library, as well as the Northside Bistro, which draws students in from all over campus. So like I said, uh, Deerfield Hall, Deer, as Jen mentioned earlier, there's also a really big focus on green space. Um, so this is a photo I took of, you know, I took on campus, I think sometime during first year. They're really an awesome site. You know, you wanna make sure you don't get close, you know, too close, this is their home too. But if you ever get the chance to see them, usually like in the mornings or later at night, I recommend you just take a few seconds to sort of take in the, the nature scenery. So also in Deerfield Hall is the Math Learning Center. This is where students can go with questions about 100 and 200 level courses uh, regarding mathematics. They also have TAs available to help with problem solving and just general learning about course material. So outside of Deerfield Hall is the Arendelle Studio Theater. Um, as I mentioned before, this is one of two. So as well as Miss Theater, we have Arendelle Studio. This is located right next to Deerfield, so you'll definitely see it if you're in the area. It is used by our theater and drama studies department, and they produce up to five productions a year, which are open to everyone to attend and participate. So even if you're not in the program, you still have the opportunity to be involved in theater life. So as we move past here, we'll go to our last building, the Student Center. So like I said, this is our last building on the tour, um, and it is the Student Center, which is home to the UTMSU or the UTM Student Union, which is a representative group of students who deal with student access to programs, services, and resources on and off campus. The cool thing about this building is that it's the only one that's completely student run, uh, partially in, you know, due to the work of the UTMSU. So they are responsible for distrib distributing what we call the UPASS, uh, so it, along with your T-Card, allows UTM students to get free access to MyWay Transit, which is the local Mississauga Transit, uh, which is super convenient, especially if you live off campus like I do. Uh, super easy, very, you know, very nice for saving money, which I like. Um, the Student Center is another really chill place on campus. They have the Blind Duck Pub, as well as a chat time, which is super popular. They're also the home to a bunch of different clubs and academic societies. Um, oftentimes you'll see events being held here, whether it's club specific or just general. Um, they also are responsible for what's called exam jam. So during exam time, they throw a bunch of different events, usually in the student center. Uh, this can range from, I think last year they did like a carnival. Sometimes they do like games. Sometimes they do like, um, you know, sip and paint nights, that kind of thing. Uh, also, I remember last year they had therapy dogs, which was my favorite part. Um, but yeah, so the Student Center, if you're ever on campus, definitely check it out. Very nice place to chill. So the last place we're going to check out is an example of one of our residences, which is Oscar Peterson Hall. Uh, this is usually where they do the residence tour if you're in person. So I just thought it would be a good example to sort of see, you know, if you're ever in the area or if you're, you know, when you're new on campus, you at least have one place to recognize. Um, so if you're interested in residence, there's a bunch of stuff online that you can find, but this one in particular, Oscar Peterson Hall, uh, is just one of various residences on campus. It is fitted with traditional dorm style units and a 250 seat dining hall. So definitely a great place for students. I haven't lived in residence personally, but some of my roommates have, 
and they they definitely say it was a great experience even if it's just for first year to sort of get a lay of the land you know a little bit less stress in terms of living and you know paying for things on your own um, but also if you just want to meet people especially which can be difficult first year I definitely recommend checking out residents. So that brings me to the end of my tour. Uh, I apologize again for some of the technical difficulties we have, but thank you so much for sticking through that with me. Um, it was so nice to bring you guys this tour and I hope you know we can answer all your questions for you. Speaking of which, I will pass it back to Jen and Michael. Thank you, Maddie. I always learn something new in your tours, always. And don't worry about the technical hiccups because Technology works when it wants to work. It's kind of like a cat that way, it does whatever it wants. <laughs> and it was fine. Um, so thank you so, so much. Uh, I, I love everything. I love the way that you take us on a tour. Like I said, I learn something new all the time. So I think now is a time to actually go through the chat and try and find some questions that we can answer. Um, and thank you all for your questions. I can see that everybody's been answering them um, madly. So we'll try and pick some of the, the questions that maybe a lot of you are thinking and see if we can answer them out loud. Um, yeah, so so again, first of all, Maddie, well done. I, I love that experience. And my mind is still thinking about your trip to Italy and I'm secretly a little jealous that you uh, <laughs> get to do that. Um, I, you, you said that, I'm like, oh, that's, that's a cool experience. Um, okay, so we do have a lot of questions. Um, thank you very much again for submitting these. Um, here we go, let's, let's pick a few here that we can answer. So here's one. Um, Roshni says, or asks, um, if you do not qualify for the specific program you apply to, um, will you be considered for any other programs that, uh, you may be qualified for, or is it an automatic rejection if you don't get into the specific program you apply to? Um, Jen, did you want to take that? Sure. As long as you're qualified, if we can't fit you into your first choice program, then we're going to try and consider you for a second choice. Um, some of you, if you have received an email saying, hey, let us know if you want to be considered for an alternate offer, go ahead and let us know what else you'd like to be considered for. It doesn't mean we're not going to still consider you for your first choice. It's, you're just kind of giving us a heads up of where we can potentially go with your application. And for others, you may not have received that email, and that's okay. If we can't get you into your first choice, we still are are going to consider you for an alternate offer of admission as well. And I can tell you, if you're given an alternate offer of admission, don't stress it. I was given an alternate offer of admission and it was the best thing that ever happened because I accidentally ended up in a program that I adored. So it eh, could happen to you too. And I will say also that we do have a session coming up I believe it's on the 28th or the 29th, specifically to discuss alternate offers. Um, so if you're one of those individuals that have, has one or you're just wondering about alternate offers, you can join me then. On that note, I will say, if you do get an alternate offer, check your email on Monday because you're gonna get an invitation to Jen's session on the 28th. So it's coming. Um, thanks very much, Jen. Um, here's a question. Uh, someone really liked the fact that, uh, Maddie, your program selection, your program kind of choices. Um, if I've already, if so, uh, the question is, if you've already been given admission to a program, um, but can you can you kind of change that and can you take courses or maybe even choose a different program? Um, is it possible to study, apply, obtain a major in an additional course or program? I think they like what you what you're studying, Maddie. That's the question. Well, that's good. Like I said, I love nothing more than to talk about my, my programs. And I think this is a really great question. And we do get it sometimes and students are often kind of confused because, you know, you come in an admission category, not everyone, you know, has a good understanding of post. I didn't have a good understanding of like programs in my, you know, for the majority of my first year. But it is definitely possible to do a bunch of that kind of stuff. So it's possible to take courses outside of your programs. It's possible to change your programs. Um, it's there's a bunch of different stuff. So personally, when I first started, I was in social sciences for anthropology. Um, but after a little bit, I realized I was more interested in the science thing. So I made sure that I took the courses that would allow me to get into the science stream in first year. Um, but it was a very easy switch since I was already in a similar program. Um, I would just advise that like if you are thinking or if you ever come to that position where you're like, 
I kind of want to switch. I, I kind of don't. Just make sure that you you have those required courses. Um, and, it, and it can technically extend your schooling, but it's very easy to do. It's sort of getting over that mental block first of changing. Um, but you you can also definitely take courses just outside of your program, just if it's an elective. Um, it can be a little challenging in the upper years when you have program or you're in like two majors or specialists where they require more courses. Um, but there's still always the option to take stuff that you're interested in. I definitely recommend doing that just, you know, to keep yourself interested in, in what you're doing. Well said, Maddie. Um, I want to add one more thing if I could, which is that no matter what programs you're studying that, um, that you, you want to study, um, the combination of programs that you're required to do to get your degree, all of them will require you to take elective courses anyway. Um, so even if you know you want to study something that you're passionate about, but you really kind of have your eye on these specific courses on the side that have nothing to do with your program, you can still take them. And in fact, you may need them to, to graduate because you have to take elective courses as part of your degree. So um, it's kind of a win-win for everybody. Um, thanks, Maddie. Um, so this is kind of a it's, it's a, it's a specific question, but I want to highlight it because I think we could talk about it more broadly. Um, is there a grappling club on campus? I will say, I don't know if there's a grappling club on campus specifically because I want to just say that there's hundreds of clubs, dozens of clubs, hundreds across UFT for sure. Um, does anyone know if we have a specific grappling club? Jen, yeah? We do not have a specific grappling okay. club yet. So if we don't have a club that you want to join, you can actually start that club. So I did put actually in the chat, responding to Kevin's uh, question as well, um, if you just go to the website, you can go to student groups and societies, um, just Google UTM student groups and societies, you're going to see that there's a lot that we already have. You're also going to find out how you can reach out to um, student groups as well, just to try and get that club set up for you. Um, we have over 160 different clubs and groups and societies, and they range from everything from fun activities to do, uh, extracurricular, you know, athletic activities, um, to cultural groups and clubs, to religious groups and clubs. Um, so there's there's everything. And if we don't have that little bit of everything that you want, you can start it. That's a, yeah. that's a good point. Maddie, go uh, ahead. Yeah, if I could just yeah. add on. Yeah. Um, also, if you're unfamiliar with some of the clubs that we have or like what you want to get interested in when you're here, within like the first week or two of the semester or like first semester, we have what's called the clubs fair. So you'll have all the different clubs, academic societies, like, uh, like Jen said, like different groups, uh, essentially just table um, for quite a while. And so you get the chance to talk with uh, members, learn a little bit more about that. So even if you're not sure right now, if you want to either get involved on campus or what you want to do, uh, you'll definitely have the opportunity to sort of figure that out. I will also say, Amy just popped into my chat to let me know that down on the St. George campus through Hart House, they actually do have um, grappling classes that you can take if you're interested. Oh. Um, you are paying for them. They're about $95. So I say just start the club here. <laughs> there you go. Shout out to Amy doing a little extra research there. Appreciate that, Amy. Uh, it actually also kind of answers another question that came up, which is on the same on the same thread. Narmina asked about uh, is there is there an MSA club on campus? Um, so yeah, it's 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 one of those things where we probably have something um, that you're looking for, and if we don't, we start it, which is fantastic. Yeah, and I can say for a fact that we do actually have a Muslim Students Association. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, we also have um, prayer space as well. So if you're looking for you know, a multi-faith space where you can actually go and have your prayers or quiet time, re reflection, uh, we do have that on campus as well for you. And I will say that our Muslim Student Association is very active. They have a lot of really cool things that go on throughout the year. Yeah. Um, so on this similar note to clubs, uh, let's go over to sports. Um, Loe asks, is there any uh, competitive varsity soccer team? But maybe we could even talk about sports in general uh, on campus. Um, I, I don't want to put you on the spot, Maddie, but do, are you in any sports on campus? I, I am not. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, no, you don't have to apologize. I do know that there's like a lot of sports going on. Um, I see them very often. Sports. There's often, yeah, sports <laughs> loosely. Hashtag um, sports, sports, yeah. sports. <laughs> there's, there's lots going on on campus, um, especially when it comes to the competition. Even if it's like between campuses, I hear about it a lot. Uh, I do know there's like 
basketball. That's it. <laughs> no, yeah. there, there's many other teams, but like that's the one I know about. So there definitely is like competitive sports teams. There is also, as far as I know, a soccer team as well, because we do have yep. um, a soccer field. There is also there's two. There's also yeah. uh, tennis and volleyball as well. Yeah. Jen, did you want to add something about sports? Sure. So we we have a lot of sports. Sports, sports, sports. Um, there are varsity sports. If you are interested in joining one of our varsity teams, you can actually go onto the website. Um, most of our varsity teams are actually housed out of the St. George campus, but you are a U of T student, so you actually can go and play varsity sports um, out of that campus. You can still be studying and living here, and just hop on the shuttle bus to take you down. Um, to the St. George campus. What I would suggest is if you are interested in playing varsity sports, reach out to the coaches. They actually have a contact information for each of the varsity teams that we have. So whether it's it's men's or women's teams, reach out to those coaches and say, hi, I'm awesome. I play this sport. How can I get on your team? They're going to be a really helpful resource for you. Um, in addition to the varsity sports, though, we actually do have our tri-campus competitions as well. So maybe you don't want to be on a varsity sports team, but you still want to be, you know, having fun and, and you're a competitive person. So why not, you know, join our team and go and compete against St. George and Scarborough as well. And then, of course, there's tons of just intramural sports as well. I'm still trying to get somebody to set up the underwater pool noodle fencing team. We don't have that here. But if you want to start it, I tell students all the time, I will be your cheerleader. So go ahead and start that just for me. <laughs> I was going to say, Jen, uh, do you want to start the underwater noodle something something <laughs> club? <laughs> the underwater pool noodle fencing team? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'd be up for joining the team. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're talking about sports. Uh, there's another question that's connected to this. Uh, thanks very much for your question, Loe. Um, Pearl. Pearl asks, uh, the gym on campus. You mentioned the gym in your tour, uh, mm -hmm. Maddie. Um, is the gym free? Are all of the uh, facilities on campus free? Do we need a membership? How does that work? Yeah, so all the facilities that like I talked about in my tour and the ones that you'll run into on campus, they are technically free. Um, I will preface it by saying a lot of that stuff you do pay for partially in like your tuition and stuff, um, but day to day costs, there is none. So it's completely, you know, free use for students and there's no additional cost. Yeah, good point. Um, you, yeah, that's it. Anything, uh, Jen, did you want to add anything? I don't know. It's a great yeah. gym. The track is lovely. It's very yeah. friendly. Yeah. Lots of elliptical machines. And if you like, <laughs> you know, riding the bikes, you can look out over the field. Yeah, it, it is actually a really attractive gym. Um, yeah. Very functional. Um, really it cool also, too. I, I, I was just going to say that, yeah, a lot of the, the facilities or services that are they're offered, they're not just kind of in person. A lot of the, they're also, also virtual classes. Um, so if, even if you, you can't make it to the gym on the day that you want to do a workout, um, look online and often there's, um, um, programs and courses that are held, um, virtually, which is really cool. Um, let's take a change of pace here and talk about residence. Um, so the question is how much do I have to pay to secure my preferred residence? Uh, so let's talk about the residence guarantee, um, and when's the deadline? Um, for the residence uh, guarantee? Perfect. Uh, I can answer that. Yeah. Um, and FYI, I'm also hosting an all about residence at UTM session, which is coming up next week. I think that's the final one before the deadline. So the guaranteed uh, residence deadline is actually coming up really, really quickly on March 31st. So 11.59 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's Toronto, Mississauga time. You want to have the first stage of your application in. Even if you're just thinking about staying in residence, go ahead and fill out that application. You do not need to have an offer in hand to fill that application out. And that first uh, portion of the application is literally just you saying, I maybe might kind of sort of would like to perhaps have a space in residence if I'm admitted, if I accept my offer of admission. There's no cost to it. So I recommend if it's even just a little inkling in, in your brain that you would like to live in residence, go ahead and complete the first step of your star res application. You will find a link to that in your join um, applicant website as well. 
So go ahead and complete that. Um, once you have an offer in hand and you accept that offer of admission, then June 2nd, you'll complete the second portion of that application. And then that's going to have, I believe it's a, initially a $300 deposit. And then later on in the summer, it'll be a little bit more. Um, so altogether, it works out to $1,600, I think, with the two amounts that you'll pay for steps two and three. Um, it's not in addition to your residence fee. It's actually part of your residence fee. They just kind of break it up into smaller chunks. But this first deadline, March 31st, is just for you to let us know to save a spot in res. You're not signing a contract. You're not um, committing to anything. You're just telling us to put a pin in a room just for you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, you said earlier, Jen, even if you're just considering it, do it. You have nothing to lose. Um, I also want to add, I get this question a lot too about the residence guarantee. Anyone can do it. There's no grade requirement. There's no, you don't have to live a certain distance away from the campus. You could be across the street or around the world. You're eligible for the guarantee. Just do yep. it by March 31st. Thanks very much, Natasha, for your question. Uh, I'm going to switch it over. Let's see. I, there was a question here that I really wanted to ask. Um, let's see. Lucas. Uh, Lucas asks, can majors and minors be taken in different post categories? Like, like mixing up categories. Yeah, um, well, yeah, I can, I can definitely, uh, sorry, I kind of jumped on you there. But, no, not at all. Um, yeah, so you definitely can. So like I said, a lot of students don't really know about post. So at the end of first year is when you pick your programs and you can either do a specialist program, a double major or a major in two minors. And there is no specifics as to what needs to be taken with what. Uh, so like with me, my anthropology is part of life sciences, but my religion is, or like my history of religions major is in humanities. So it's very common for students to take um, majors, minors, or like, you know, programs across different categories, uh, especially if you're, say, in like a smaller one, like life sciences only has a few programs versus like social sciences or humanities who has more to them. So yeah, like I said, it's very, very common. Uh, I know, like, I think one of the first times I came to campus, I met someone and they were doing a double major in um, forensic science and theater and drama or like, you know, English and drama. And I, I thought it was just the funniest thing because I was uh -huh. like, oh, wow. So that's just a kind of example of like, even if you're at, you know, two, ex you know, the two extreme ends of the spectrum, there's lots of mixing available for students. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's amazing to see the combinations that people come up with. Um, it's really amazing. Um, thanks for your question, Lucas. All right, here we go. Let's see. What do we got next? We have, uh, there was one that I wanted to put up. I think it just slipped because the question didn't come in. Oh, here's an easy one. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Can you join a club in another campus? Okay. <laughs> um, I'm no? not really sure. <laughs> Sorry, I that was my bad. Okay, fine. I would the, think you probably could. Yep. And the reason I say you probably could is I know that if you are interested in joining LSAT uh, prep or MCAT prep, if you're planning on going to med school or law school, you can actually join those clubs on other campuses. Yep. Um, you'd probably need permission. What I would recommend is just reach out to those clubs and be like, hey. I'm a UTM student. Can I come yeah. all the way up to Scarborough to join your grappling club if you have yeah. one? Yeah, I, pretty much the, the the student clubs that are that are out, all of the the, the student. Yes, the, mostly the answer is yes. Um, the there are, might be specific clubs that have requirements of, of being on campus. Um, the only I guess limitation would just be the distance you'd have to travel if there are any meetings or events that are hosted on in a different part of the city. Um, but most most of them, if not all of them. Um, yes, you're good to go. You're a U of T student first. Uh, okay, thanks for your question. Sorry, I made that sound like it was such a, sorry, that, that's my fault. Sorry about that, y'all. All right, uh, I'm gonna scroll down here a little bit. I was gonna ask, let me ask you a question, Maddie, while I'm looking for another question. It has nothing to do, nobody's asked this, this is me asking, all right? <laughs> Your trip to Italy, if we can bring that up again. Yes. Okay. What are you most excited to eat in Italy? Because if anything for me, traveling um, means trying food. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm a pasta person, so I, I got to say it's kind of the boring answer. But um, I'm pretty lucky because the, the course that I got accepted to, it's on religion in Tuscany. So 
we get to go into a bunch of different places in Italy. So Siena, uh, Tuscany, Rome. So I'm sort of just excited to try sorry, everything. So <laughs> yeah, I, I don't really that's know fair. anything in particular. No, that's fair. Okay. Uh, past says life. Why not? Uh, okay, I have one question here, and, I, and uh, so Ronnie says, okay, so they've accepted their offer to UTM. First of all, first of all, you've accepted your offer, which means you applied and you got in. Where is it? Where is it? I'm going to put this up. Congratulations, Ronnie. Well done. Well done. <laughs> okay. Ronnie says, but on my application status, it says that they are waiting uh, on final official documents, but they already submitted their high school transcripts. Um, so what could that mean? Jen, do you want to provide some context? Sure. So when you apply, and if you're a current high school student, typically the transcripts that you upload to us or that you send to us are, are going to be considered unofficial. Um, so if you're still taking high school courses, we're still going to want to see a final official transcript sent to us from the institution that you're studying at. And that's going to allow us to then clear the conditions of your offer of admission. So congratulations on your offer. Submitting that final official transcript will allow us to clear those conditions and welcome you on campus in September. Now, if you did already send the, the final official transcript, give us a call or send us an email just so that we can take a look and make sure that it's been recorded in the system properly. But chances are you're probably still taking some courses and we'll need to have your, your school or your institution send that final official transcript to us. Um, usually it can be sent a couple of ways through mail or through um, email, but we'll actually have that listed very specifically in your offer letter as well. Congrats, Ronnie. Well done. It's awesome. Um, so we, we have a few more questions, but I'm also being mindful of time. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to put one more question up uh, and an, uh, have it answered here. So the last question for the night, uh, Roshni asked, when is the latest date an applicant can expect to receive an offer of acceptance? But I think I might amend that and say, can expect to hear back from the university. Yeah, okay. I, honestly, I would think by the end of May, you should have a really good idea whether or not you know an admissions decision has been made. I think at any time that you're you know starting to worry or you're panicking because you haven't heard anything, um, you just contact us because then we can take a look at your, your application and give you a better idea of the timeline. If you're a student that's here, a, a domestic student, for example, that's here um, in on like an Ontario in a high school student, or sorry, in a high school situation, you're going to find out by the end of May anyways. It's a it's a guarantee. Um, but I would say for anyone, if you're ever panicked about it, just know that by the end of May, that's usually when we want to have all of the admissions decisions out. And if there's an extenuating circumstance, um, or if you are just starting to panic, give us a call, send us an email. We'll definitely look into it. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's uh, start to wrap things up. I wanna thank everybody for asking your amazing questions. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Amy and uh, Neha in the back for answering, and Jen and Maddie as well for answering. Um, but I'm going to throw it over to Jen uh, to wrap things up for us. Perfect. So thank you for all of those questions that uh, I think was a good question to end off on. So um, thank you, Maddie. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, uh, Neha and Amy in the chat for all of your assistance during the presentation. And thank all of you for joining us today. Um, don't forget check out our virtual campus tour at uofte.me forward slash UTM tour. You can just Google tour at UTM and you'll have a bunch of selections for you. Um, I would also like to note that we do have a variety of online events that are coming up um, that you might want to join. So I mentioned, you know, we do have the all about residence information coming up. We'll have lots of Ask a recruiter sessions where you can join myself and my colleagues um, for very small group meetings. That way you can ask any questions that you happen to have as long as they're pretty general in nature. And again, you can ask us individual specific to your, your own application if you'd like via email. Um, and then finally, remember, follow us on social media. We are at UTM Future. Um, and if you have any further questions, please don't hesitate to contact us. We love speaking with our applicants. Uh, we're very, very happy to help. And thank you again. We wish you all the best of luck. Congratulations if you have an offer in hand. Our fingers are crossed for the rest of you. We're always here for you and have a fantastic remainder to your morning or your afternoon or your evening. Thanks. Everyone. Bye, everyone.